just basically get dressed in the morning and walk out the door and love being filmed and women will like spend all this time on themselves but like, don't film them <laughs> shalom is it live? Are we live yes we are live. hi everybody welcome this is our second Pesach installment um, just to recap yesterday it was very simple um, and that is that chametz is sheker we're trying to get rid of all the sheker as I said yesterday that I had a big challah on Shabbos big fluffy challah and I cut off this big slice in front of my family. Today we have the Yisrael Noach here. Hashem, make sure you film Yisrael Noach also. And uh, say hi, Yisrael Noach. Hi. Got him on there? Yeah. So, anyway, um, and then I took this big fluffy chala and I, I squeezed it down in l literally one second down to the size of a credit card. Down to the size of a credit card because chametz is sheker. And we're discussing, we're dealing with the foundations of our nation. And the whole founding of the nation's gotta be based on truth. You know, you imagine you married some girl and you found out like a million things about her that, that totally, that everything she told you was not true. And now you find out like she's from some other country and like, you know, the daughter of two like, the daughter of like two, you know, ex-cons or something, you know. And she, she really works for the mafia but if you can somehow naturalize her as a Israeli citizen, they will not be coming after her. You know, you find all this out like the second day after the marriage. You know, how's the marriage going to grow? So foundations have to be based on truth. So that's our first lesson. And that was yesterday's lesson, which I developed for an hour. <laughs> Sorry, it's not that big a lesson. But that foundations have to be based on truth. You get it? You ever thought about that? So we're like getting rid of all the chametz, all the fluff, all the, all the sheker. And, and we can look throughout our lives on all the aspects of our life that are just fluff. And we're putting way too much on that fluff. And how do you know what's the acid test that you're putting too much emphasis on fluff? Is if you somehow can't find your fluff or your fluff gets dented or your fluff gets stolen. or so How are you affected by that? How does it affect you to have your fluff disappear? You know, you can't find that that pair of shoes, you know, that were like the just the pair you wanted for that wedding or something. <laughs> so, you know, obviously shoes are fluff. You got to wear something on your feet, but to have that many shoes is fluff, and to have the exact pair for the wedding is fluff. Not a big deal. Uh, for by all means, you know, if you can wear the perfect pair of shoes and you can afford them, and you're also someone who gives back to society at the same time, um, for sure, get the right pair of shoes for the outfit. But the acid test of how much you're addicted to fluff is how emotionally affected you are by uh, situations where your fluff gets messed up. You know? Now, you can already get, you can get to higher levels where even your non-fluff gets messed up. Like, for example, let's say someone just has a car that's totally non-fluff. Careful of the noise because it's recording. Let's say you have a non-fluff car. You know, it's like a Toyota Corolla, which I don't even know what that means, but something about the sound of it is like, it's super non-fluff, you know. You know, it just gets you from one place to another, it's just a people mover. So, you have a Toyota Corolla people mover, and, and it gets banged up, so now you're out of your car. Now, that was not fluff. You needed that people mover. Now, it's a higher level to be able to be totally steady while having just lost your people mover. You know, because you come out from a store and you find someone like, I don't know, like the, the trash truck somehow, like, too, too wide a turn and, like, took your car on, like, a 40-yard 40, 40 uh, bang-up, you know. And the, how much would that affect you? That's non-fluff. You can go even further. Like, there's even higher-level people who are working on releasing their attachments to even family. Can you imagine that? Imagine a person who's releasing attachment to spouse and children, not that they're not involved and in love and crazy for their family, their wife, their kids, or their husband, their children, but, they're, but they, they really want to be connected only to God. And they don't mind loving their husband, they don't mind loving their children, but they want to be connected to God. I can tell in a second uh, with parents how their connection to God is versus their connection, their attachments are to this world. And uh, the best way to tell is I'll go to a kiddish on Shabbos, and I will find a, um, you know, I'll see some old student of mine, and he's holding a child, you know, like a little smaller than Yisrael Noach back here, and 
what I'll do is I'll go to the child, like put my hands out to the child. The child doesn't know me. If the child jumps out of the parent's arms into my arms, so then I know the parents are doing very well. If on the other hand, the child goes into like a death grip, so then that child is either a more attached child just by nature, which some children are that way, but sometimes parents actually are clinging on to their children because their child is the most meaningful thing that ever happened to them. Which I understand for a lot of people that having children is the most meaningful thing that ever happened to them. So in other words, your child is your meaning. If your child is your meaning, that means God's not your meaning. God's a, God's a, God's contextual. He adds context to my life, but my meaning is this child. And you can tell from just the way the child clings on to the parents that really they learn that. That's a learned thing. Because you'll see that, that a kid whose parents are attached only to God, that the children are much freer to go. They'll go, they'll go really to anyone, those kids. Unless it's a unique kid. I, I myself, I have a lot of kids in the and they, and they, I've noticed there have been a couple kids who are more clingy, but most of my kids were always just happy to go to anybody. And they, because my, my wife and I, we had those kids not because of our paternal or maternal instincts. We had those kids because we, are, we see the, a planet in peril and we'd like to make a difference. And what greater way than full-time training. Now, I'm here to train you to make a difference, but you're not going to follow me home. I'm not going to be telling you, I'm not going to be telling you bedtime stories, you know, I, I hope. Yeah. And uh, speaking of which, we need tremendous help following, I, actually, please follow me home today. We, we need help for Pesach. I'm post-surgery, <laughs> and my wife's got a sprained ankle, and we're like freaking out. We, we're really behind the eight ball. We should have we been cooking Pesach yesterday, but we're still, our kitchen still hasn't even turned over because we're just lacking manpower. So if anyone would be willing to come to our house, I will put the address on the board. <laughs> for all the internet to see. Yeah. On that seed 11. Okay. On that seed 11. And uh, if anyone's willing, please come up to me afterwards. And, and uh, we'll, we'll give you something to scrub or something. Or something to go buy in the shook. You know? But we, we're just lacking serious just hands because I can't even like bend down right now. He's been very helpful. Right? You've been helping Tati with everything? Thank you. You want to color them? This will be your, your spot where you color, okay? Maybe that's your little page. Now, um, anyway, so, so kids are often the most meaningful thing that ever happened to somebody. But kids aren't the meaning of life. Kids are, you know, plants have kids. You know, have you been to the zoo lately? <laughs> like it's, it's nothing more fun watching the chimpanzees. That, you know, they have kids too. You know, they, the whole entire plant and animal kingdom reproduces. You know, so if your reproducing was the most meaningful thing that ever happened to you, you're in trouble. Because God did not put you down here to reproduce. God put you down here to, for connection, to attach yourself to the Creator. Repro reproduction is important. It's certainly a very highly Kabbalistic thing, but uh, when it comes to human beings, but it's uh, it's not a meaning of life that you were able to have children. Fair, very important part of life, but not the meaning of life. Now, um, and also, um, my, I myself, I'll tell you that I did not have much of an instinct at all for it. But once I started learning Torah, I was like, whoa, like I've got the cure. I got the cure for the planet. So I want, who am I going to have the most time with? So probably my children. So I'm going to just have as many as possible, to just have as many solutions as possible. So I understand people who don't have anything to teach, why they might be like, you know, you know preaching overpopulation, lack of resources, maybe we should have less kids, and, you know, or maybe I'm not going to have kids because I don't want to bring kids into this situation of this world. I understand those people, but if you actually have answers, if you actually have solutions for the planet's problems, well, your biggest impact you can possibly have would be having an influence on your children, because your children are, are deeply, deeply influenced by you. And so, for that reason, you want to have a lot of them. You want to have a lot of kids. 
But until you've discovered the meaning of your life, so then have, wanting to have a lot of kids is like, I don't know, it's like OCD or something. That's weird. So what are you gonna do? You, you know what it takes to have a lot of kids? My wife says at the end of her life, she's gonna take her body, it'll be just like draped, like down from all the use, and she's just gonna like throw it at Hashem. At the end of her life, she's like, here it is. Here's the body you gave me. I used every last drop of this thing for you. That's how she lives her life. It's amazing, amazing. And, and, and while doing aerobics and while doing yoga and, and in the gym, you know, almost every day, and, and uh, you know, because she, she doesn't, she could use it and also, you know, God forbid, die young, you know, from overuse, because she really overuses it, but she's doing it all, you know, in, with the full attention to uh, health maintenance, and juicing, and all the different you know, health aspects of, of her life. But she's for sure wiped out right now, Arab of Pesach. Now, today's class. That was all. That was all. Uh, getting you up to speed. So, foundations start on truth. That's step one. When I was a child, I used to go with my grandfather to shear sheep in the uh, mountains. Um, he was a wool trader, and therefore knew all the sheep herders and old people and we would go all jump into his Jeep and my brothers and I would jump into his Jeep and he would take us out into the beautiful rolling hills of Northern California and we'd get out of the car where all the giant sheep are and there were these monstrous sheep. These sheep are specifically bred for their wool, they're monstrous woolly sheep. And we were scared to get out of the car but we jumped out of the car and hid under my grandfather's legs. And he's trying to walk us over to the shearing booth. And we're all hiding under his legs from these scary sheep. <laughs> when we finally got to the shearers, we finally got to the shearers and saw the first shear, first sheep sheared. The sheep came out like super scrawny, like really scrawny. I Meaning it was like out to here. And it just went down to like that. And, and, and it just became like, it looked like an oversized rodent. And it was also very goopy. It was covered in lanolin, which is the sheep sweat. It's the active ingredient in all your skincare products. And sheep sweat. So it's got a nicer term though, lanolin. And the, uh, which by the way, Lanzano is the most amazing stuff. We, we must have 10 bottles of Lanzano going around our house. It's 100% lanolin. And uh, you can just say, say goodbye to cracked fingers and. And it seems no matter what your skin condition is, if you put that stuff on it, your skin like restores back to like childbirth. The, it's amazing. It's amazing stuff. So anyway, but the here are these goopy, thin, scrawny little rodent-like sheep. And my brothers and I just came out from my grandfather's legs. There was nothing to be afraid of. All our fear was gone. There was nothing to be afraid of. It's just a scrawny goopy sheep, a scrawny, goopy sheep, a scrawny, goopy sheep, scrawny, goopy sheep. And the word for scrawny, the word for like thin and kind of yuck in Hebrew, mm -hmm. The word Matesar. The word Matesar is the word for that scrawny goopy sheep. It means narrow straits. Okay, the narrow straits. Yep. Now, all of us have inside of us a, a self image of being this narrow goopy sheep. All of us have inside of us this very limiting voice. It's our self-image voice of being that 
narrow, goopy sheep. It's all the limiting voices. They're inside your head. Most of them are unconscious. It's the inside, underneath all the wool. And the, it has voices like, like uh, dumb, ugly, um, dumb, ugly, unlovable, worthless, weak, not good enough, incapable, <laughs> incapable, lost, Acceptable. I, you can imagine I can just keep going and going and going. I mean, it just it just goes and goes and goes and goes. And and this is the this is ultimately everyone's self-image. Deep underneath it all, this is everyone's self-image. Underneath it all, it's unconscious. Most people are not walking around aware of that. And. The, and this is our mate's art. Our mate's art is, is these self-image voices. It's that scrawny little sheep. It's the scrawny little sheep. Now, no one, could anyone live with themselves with such a self-image? No one could live with themselves with such a self-image. So what we do instead is we create something called Semer, which is, which makes this become the inner self-image, and then we create what's called the outer. the inner self-image, and then we create what is the outer self-image. And again, this word means narrow, and the word for mates are, is the word wool. Sorry, simmer is the word wool. And you'll notice, by no coincidence, that it's got the same exact letters. It's actually made of it. The word for wool, you know, the puff out stuff, that are the way it's our outer self image, it's the image we're portraying, is, is actually just made of wool. It's just puff. Puff and stuff. Puff stuff. Which was yesterday's class. Just get rid of all the puff. The, it's, it's our chametz. And that's the simmer. That's the wool we were so afraid of. But what you find is that the actual root of the wool is the mezar. Because what's causing me to puff myself out? Why would I want to puff out, puff myself out from the inner self-image? Why do I want to puff myself out? I want to puff myself up because who could live with themselves with this kind of list of, of adjectives about myself, right? Who can live with themselves? So what we do instead is we make a whole list of outer self-image things. So you guys can just, you'll tell me what to write. For dumb, what should we write? Okay, I can write smart. Usually I write more unique things like know-it-all or always being right or uh, public speaker or you know, the, <laughs> the, the one who can't, you know, be quiet or whatever. Or, you, know, you know what I mean? Like the Googler. The Getting very personal here. Yeah. 
there. <laughs> okay, so smart. What's the next one? Pretty. Beautiful. Okay, we'll call this put together. I'm going to be meaner. Okay, what's the next one? Unlovable. A flirt. Okay, so very good. Flirt. <laughs> Cling on. What else? Keep going. There's plenty for these. Joker. Plastograph. What? Plastograph. Couldn't hear it? Magnet. That's cling on. Is it really though? That's plastic. Magnets are a totally different world. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what you mean by magnet. What do you mean by magnet? Like a person magnet. Like a... Oh, like a social... Yeah, magnet. like a social magnet. Yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh. We'll just put the... We'll like charismatic. It, we're going to call it a butterfly. <laughs> okay, it goes on and on. Okay, for worthless, what's that going to be? Useful. Yeah, you, okay, useful. Girl. That's the most... <laughs> Sounds like a spoon. Useful, I mean, that has some girl. Swiss pocket knife, it's like very useful. Irreplaceable. Yeah, useful, irreplaceable. Worth a lot. Sounds like a world. <laughs> okay, uh, what, what's next? Uh, worthless, weak. So uh, the obvious would be, you know, strong. Capable. Workaholic. Untouchable. Meaning nothing touches me. <laughs> Untouchable meaning emotionally, like, like I'm beyond, I'm beyond any. Uh... Unemotional. <laughs> right. Untouchable. Insensitive. Unemotional. Uh, what's after that? Uh, not good enough. Over Amazing. Overachiever. Loquacious and loquacious. Overachiever. <laughs> Incapable. We'd have uh, we'd have the also the overachiever, workaholic. Uh, lost would be the uh, street the, smart. The seeker, maybe. <laughs> The seeker and unacceptable would be the chameleon. How's that like to fit in? Chameleon. Something like that. Anyway, you see what's going on here? You see where Pesach's leading us to? Because as of Yud Nisan, as of the the date, Yud Nisan, the 10th of Nisan. Today is the, I don't even know, the 5th or 6th of Nisan. 7th of Nisan. So three more days from now is the 10th of Nisan. And on the 10th of Nisan, you have to take your sheep. And you got to, it says in the Torah, you tie it to your bedpost. Okay. Tying a sheep to your bedpost, like, imagine explaining that to your wife. She's like, couldn't think of anywhere else to put this thing. <laughs> Where's it going to be going to the bathroom? You know? like potty, can we potty train the sheep, please? Yeah. Anyway, the but you got to tie why to your bed? Why to your bed post? To your bed post meaning your inner room. You got to bring it to the inner. You got to go inside and go in the inner room of your life. Like you got to look in deep. You got to check this out. You know what's going on in there for four days: the tenth, eleventh, twelfth, and thirteenth. For those four days, you have to examine your sheep. What is this sheep? This sheep is the god of the Egyptians, which the Jews are going to slaughter. It's the god of the Egyptians. It's the Egyptian god in, inside of us. So when we examine our sheep, what you find is you've got an inner self-image. That's your inner world with this whole list of things, and then you've got this outer self-image, which is kind of the, the one we're trying to portray to the world. It's our outer game. It's the, 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 the self-image we're trying to show the world. Is there any truth here? Remember, we're searching for chametz. We're getting rid of the fluff. We're getting rid of the fluff. We're getting rid of all that wall. It's just we're going deeper today. Today is the deeper class, because now we're talking about the real stuff inside. But is there anything truthful here? Give me an example. 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can you just come here for a second, please? Did you just stand right here. I'll show you where to stand. Hold your Keep standing here. I'm just showing you where to stand. <laughs> like Stay right there. Okay? <laughs> Stay right there. Do not move. Okay. Now I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to point. Anything true here? <laughs> Absolutely not. And I could have replaced this with any kid. There are a bunch of kids earlier running around in there. <laughs> Let's hear it for my lovely assistant. Thank you. It was like, when did this happen? At what point did this take place? And the answer, you, you don't understand my question? When, when did this go wrong? And the answer is never, never did. There was never a time where it ever became true. Yet each one of us could tell stories. <clears throat> All of us have stories. I have my own story. I know what it happened to me. You know, each one, literally each one of these, I can tell you a different story from my childhood of where, you, where, where I came from. And you'd all look at me like, <laughs> nice story. You know, Rabbi, come on. You know, like, I understand that happened, but it happened. You know, it happened. Let's focus on the duh. Everyone join me on the duh. It happened. Duh. Like, duh. like, it's over. Like, that happened, and then it ended. But for us, it didn't end. It began. When something happened, when you're a little kid and something happens, it's not like it happened and it's over. It happened, and then it became, like, true about you. It became true about you. Not really true, but about you. <laughs> it somehow was be, was true about you, which is like insane. Because uh, should I bring him back? Oh, wait, we have an outline of him. Yeah, there he is. So it's like what? How, hey, that's not true. And you all just witnessed that it's absolutely not true. But somehow it became true about you. Now the crazy thing, and here's the weird part is that it becomes a vibrational energy though, because anyone who believes something about themselves, you can imagine that's gonna have a vibrational effect. And once you have vibrational, once something does have a vibrational impact on you, it will radiate outward and cause what? What kind of interactions is it gonna cause? It's gonna cause those kind of interactions over and over and over again. And they're gonna validate themselves. And it will become truer and truer and truer. And that's the scary part. You understand, whatever his vibrational energy is based on his stuff, and I don't know it because I don't follow him around all day, the vibrational energy of a person causes the constant revalidation of that thing because, you know, let's say, for example, it was a, a uh, not getting picked for something. It could be a game, a play, a, a, a sport, a, a show, you know, anything, but just not picked, okay? Not a big deal. You can't always pick, you know, you can't pick everyone every time. But if that becomes the, the thing which makes them feel, uh, I don't know, a little lost, or unacceptable, or maybe, un, maybe un, uh, worthless or yeah, incapable, incapable, but maybe we'll add one of uh, being uh, uh, insignificant. Insignificant. <laughs> That's funny, I put an apostrophe. Insignificant. Um, it also has the word sign in it. In, sign, if, if I can't. <laughs> so, anyway. Once someone has that insignificant thing going on, and now you're in another situation where they have to pick someone, like someone's got to get picked, or someone's not going to be getting dessert, or you know there were only 
five slices of pie, yet there's seven people in the room. How predictable is it that the person who's doing the insignificant vibrational energy is going to be not eating that pie? It's highly predictable. Highly predictable. I got, for example, I vibrate, I, my vibrational energy is like, is, is like, I'm not even going to tell you what it is, but it's like, it's, it's highly developed, let's call it. And people don't say no to me very often, and I'm careful when I ask for things, because I just know that it could be a win-lose, and I have a rule that I only ask something if it's a win-win. So, uh, so I got my first no in three months last night, yesterday. My first no in three months. And what I do, I went to the skin doctor, and, and I, I didn't have, no one had an appointment. <laughs> no one in my family had an appointment. So I go into the skin doctor, and I bring five kids before Pesach. You know, this one's got a little fungus on their foot. This one's got a, uh, uh, you know, wart needs burning off. Like everyone had something. Aww. And and so I go in, but so but I'm the kind of guy who can walk in and just say like, uh, do you mind taking my five children? Uh, none of us have an appointment. <laughs> and she just looks at me and she's like, no, <laughs> it's the end of my day. I, I waited till we were last. I kind of came then. And uh, she's like, it's the end of my day, you know, if you want me to see you, I'll see you, but, you know, like, see one of you. you know, I'm not seeing five of you. Anyway, I came out, and my kids were like, what'd she say? Because my kids know, like, everyone always says yes, so I came out, and she said no. And they were like, no. And I'm like, yes. It was amazing. Like, no. No is no. Because what would that have been if she had taken me and my five kids for her at the end of her day? What would that have been, win, win or win lose? Win lose. It would have been a big win-lose for her. And she had the, the uh, COVID asked me, I don't know how to say that, the uh, self-respect self to say no. Now, the, um, this vibrational energy is not true. It's false. We're going into Pesach. Pesach's about getting rid of what's not true. We're leaving Egypt. But what greater Egypt is there than what's on the board right now? I mean, think about the Egypt. Let's say you're really good at these things. Let's say you really developed a tremendous set of, set, you know, a tremendous coat of wool. Yeah, you got a tremendous fluffy coat of wool. And you're really good at this, and you get all the recognition for it. And you even get money for it. A lot of these make a lot of money too. Like you're getting all the money and you're getting all the recognition and everything's like going fabulous. Does that mean life's good? Is it does that mean life's good? Is this person relaxed? Is this person at ease? Is this person at, at peace? Is this person Absolutely not? Yeah, is this person full of energy or at the end of the day or exhausted at the end of the day? Exhausted. Exhausted. You see how exhausting this is. <coughs> And by the way, I only listed the ones that people use for fight. I didn't even list the flight one. Because for every one of these, there's a flight. You know, like, I'm not going to raise my hand ever in class. Uh, I'm never, ever going out to date. Um, you know, I will, I, I'm just going to disappear into my screen now that we have smartphones. I'll just live on my screen. You know? I'll live on my screen. Or I'll have Facebook friends. You, know? um, you, you get what I'm saying? Like the, uh, I'll never volunteer for anything. Uh, as opposed to the volunteers fight it, the flight it is I'll never volunteer for anything. You get you get what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm gonna avoid any situation where I could be seen as weak. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll certainly never stick my head out too far. If, Anyone should know I'm not good enough, so I'll just stay lay low. Do you get what I'm saying? Like all of these, we only we only did the exhausting ones. These are the exhausting ones. These are the ones that basically shorten your life, because you because you just it's never enough. It's never enough when you generate from here. This is never enough. It's never enough, and and then you finally go to sleep. You know. You don't go to sleep. These days, people just pass out. But you finally pass out in front of your, your phone or whatever you pass out with. And the next day, you got to start it all over again. 
you better hope you get some nice comments in the morning or the rest of this messed up. So it's really exhausting to go with the outer self-image. And, and we only did the fight ones, and I just mentioned the flight ones. All the flight ones. And believe me, we're all, I mean, when you can dominate Sam, you're in fight. If you, if you situate, if you like digitize the situation, you realize you can't fight this one. I mean, you're not gonna win this. Whatever, it's a party, and there's some guy who's like a million times more charismatic or something. And you see him like holding court. Yeah, for sure. If I can dominate, I'll dominate. If I can't, I'll, I'll automatically have another way I go to fly for that. But my question was, is there any truth here? Is there any well-being on this board? Is there any peace here? Is there any... Ready for this one? Is there any freedom? Is there any freedom on the board? Can you guys say any freedom on this board? No? It seems highly predictable, doesn't it? Meaning once you know something about someone, you can basically predict what they're going to be doing. And you also get their fight and flight mechanisms pretty predictable too. Like for example, you can bet I'll dominate a party growing up. I'll be that guy dominating the party. You can bet that. And no matter who's already dominating the party, I will get in there and dominate that party. That you can bet. But you can also bet another guy's gonna come in there and just be like, no way, no way am I gonna touch this party. You know, I, I don't mind drinking a little alcohol and sitting on the side and having a one-on-one -on -one with someone. But I'm not gonna try that. I'm not gonna get, I'm not getting near that. You know, the, me, the nucleus of the party, I'm not getting near that. There's no freedom there. This is the ultimate, ultimate Mitzrayim, the ultimate Egypt, the ultimate subjugation. We have to tie the ship to our bed four days straight. We got to look in there and see what's going on. Slave to thoughts and ideas and the vibrational energies that have become me. And I need to spend four days going in deep. Gotta go in deep. You know what four days is? Four days, figure if you sleep seven hours, so that leaves you 17 hours. Is that the math? Is that right? What's 17? <laughs> it leaves you. <laughs> Not a lot of mathematicians in the room right now. But, uh, 17 times 4. Four days straight. 68. What is it? 68? 68. You guys got 68 hours starting. When's the 10th of Nissan going to hit? Today's the 7th? So today's Monday, right? So Tuesday's the 8th. Wednesday's the 9th. Thursday's the 10th. So starting Wednesday night, you have 68 hours. If you sleep seven hours a night, 68 hours to check out the sheep. It's a lot of hours. <laughs> but don't do anything else. Meaning clean for hummus and certainly help out at the Glazer house or if you don't help out at our house, go help out somewhere else. Clean for hummus, but that clean for hummus is the work. That's the external version of it's the external version of, of us scouring for, sh for sh sheker that we're telling ourselves about ourselves and another kind of sheker that we're telling the world about ourselves. And then on the 14th of Nisan, on the fourth day, which is really the fifth day, if you count the 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, we're going to slaughter that thing. We're going to slaughter it. And we're going to burn it on a spit. You're not allowed to cook the Corbin Pesach. The Passover sacrifice cannot be cooked in a pot because it, we don't want its juices. We're not interested in any of it. We just want the bare meat. We just want the shawarma. Yeah, we just want the meat. We don't want to be involved in anything else of it. 
And we'll take the blood, put it on our doorpost, because where this most affects you is when you walk out of your house. You know, once you're in your house, you can kind of like feel some, somewhat safe. You know. But uh, you got to put the Paschal Lamb's blood on your doorposts. Now, of course, the Torah tells us it's going to be on the doorpost as a sign to God, you know, not to, to pass over your house and not kill the firstborn of the house. That's the basic. But it's also just interesting that we take the blood and we put it on the doorpost. Because it's the blood is, the Torah teaches, the blood is the essence of an animal. It's like the real essence of the animal. It's the nefesh, the essence. And we got to put that on our doorpost because it's when we go outside our house that we most have to suffer for this stuff. Our houses were a little safe. And that takes us to freedom. So then the question is, who are you really? Because if you're not, if you're not all this garbage, yeah, which is just total garbage, if you're not all this garbage, which is an absolute lie, and you're not, your reaction, right? Think about this, this is all reaction. You get that? This is all reaction to a lie. Is, is reaction to a lie true? His reaction to lie of truth? No way. So you're not the lie, obviously. You can't, pos you can't be a lie. You are real, man. And you are awesome. And you're created, the Torah tells us you're created in the image of God. You're like godly. You're godly, holy people. Period. So all of that is the lie. The scrawny, goopy sheep lie. The mates are. And then we puff ourselves out with all that wool, which is really what's the root of the wool. What's, you know, wool has roots. It's the scrawny sheep. So the actual root of all the wool, our outer self-image, is all the puff, all the chametz of our cells. Is, that's all chametz. That's the... Uh, but that's not who we are. That's just a reaction to a lie. A reaction to a lie is a lie. I remember once in my hippie days, I used to be like a really hardcore anti-war protesting hippie. In my good old days. I still am, really. I kept the long hair. So, he's got some too. We both have long hair. Except we don't call it hair. Anyway, in my long hair hippie days, I remembered this amazing, amazing moment. And what I realized was we had become like the world's experts on things that were not true. Like, for example, uh, for example, companies that burn rainforest for, you know, for burger meat, you know, uh, and, you know, the rainforest is the lungs of our planet. Like, if we don't have the rainforest, the planet's just going to totally disappear. And so, but meanwhile, they'll clear cut massive tracts of the Amazon for more burger meat, which is clogging cholesterol and cholesterols of people's hearts and, and uh, you know, creating a gigantic, gigantic medical deficit in country after country after country with, the, with the, uh, you know, the, these non-healthy fast food, quick diets. And so what happened was we were really experts in all of this, all the lies. But what was my moment of truth? My moment of truth was realizing that I'm a reaction to a lie, which does not make me true. If someone were to walk up to me right now and ask me, so, you seem to be really up to date on what's not true. So tell me, what is true? I don't know. <laughs> no one ever asked me that before. You know, what is true? You get that? A reaction to a lie. And then we, believe me, we built quite a lifestyle out of that. I mean, we had such a scene going on in the university in Santa Barbara. You know, we had such a scene going on over there. We created a whole culture. But that whole culture had nothing true to it. We were just a pure reaction. Now, in all fairness, I, I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not here to like bag on the 
hippie community, because in all fairness, they do have one truth, and it's really special truth, and that is uh, love. They definitely go for love, and they definitely are. They're anti-war, and so they automatically made the, you know, the deal. If you're against war and killing and hate, so therefore, what should we be about? We should be about love. And I did realize that. And I also realized the hypocrisy of, of, uh, of taking someone's heart. You know, even though I was a secular guy at the biggest party school in the world, I realized the, the, um, that taking someone's heart close to yours, but not forever, is hypocrisy. Like you're gonna preach love, but break hearts. You get the hypocrisy in that? So, and not to mention the fact that you're breaking the heart of someone else's so, to the spouse to be, which is super uncool, because that creates scar tissue that no wedding ring fixes. You know, people, people, you know, girls hope, girls hope that you know, oh, when they're finally married, men hope when they finally marry someone that you know, okay, you know, there, there's the wedding band. Like obviously, I get the whole heart. And the answer is no, you get the heart minus all the scar tissue of anyone she ever gave her heart to. And it's not that she can't work through it, but I can tell you it's not a short process. It's decades. It's decades. And this is why uh, anyone who's never given their heart to someone should make sure they never, ever, ever give their heart to someone until they have an insurance policy on their finger. The wedding band is an insurance policy for your heart. You never give your heart until you have an insurance policy. And for those who already blew it and gave their heart to somebody, um, don't do it again. <laughs> you know, just less scar tissue. You know, less scar tissue. Give the person you dedicate your life to the, the uh, merit of getting all of your heart, or at least whatever's left of it, if someone's had their heart broken. Let them have all of your heart. Anyway, but the, but in deference to the hippies, they did at least know one thing, and that was that was love. They knew about love, and, but nothing else. I mean, just love. What else? What else? You need? Okay, how should I spend my day? You know, like, what am I actually supposed to do all day? And what, what's life all about? And what's the purpose of it all? They could never answer that. And that was a great moment of truth for me in my life, realizing that I was a master of falsehood. A master of falsehood. I had aligned my entire life against falsehood. But what was true? No idea. I knew about love, love was true. You know, I, I definitely, I remember saying the words to myself that the next person who gives her heart to me will be the one who has a wedding which is a funny thing to say in a total atheistic party scene in Santa Barbara in my last year in university, but I said those words, and I held to them. Like, literally, the next person who gave me your heart was the woman I'm married to for 23 years. And so I kept my word on that. I keep my word in general, in life. Um, so we're starting off our nationhood we're all going to be sitting there Seder night, experiencing freedom. But if you look at the board, how, how can you experience freedom if this is the modus apparatus of your life? You get that? How can you possibly experience freedom if this is what you're up to? So this becomes... This isn't like a luxury, it's not a negotiable, this is non-negotiable. And we're all doing so much for Passover this year, like, this is the basic inner work for freedom. It's to realize you are amazing, you're created in the image of God, you're, you're a, from B'nai Israel. It's an amazing nation. Now it sounds very simple, but it is very simple. This is very complicated. This is very complicated, you have to identify your, you got to, Examine the sheep. You gotta examine the sheep. But once you examine the sheep, we're, the, the rest is very simple. I live a very, very simple life. 
I radiate very simple vibrational energy. My vibrational energy is not complex at all. And that's why it's so effective. <laughs> my vibrational energy is not complex. I get that. Oh, and that's up. My vibrational energy is not complex at all, but it's, uh, and, it, and that's why it's most effective. You know, people have. Storage almost full. You can manage your storage in settings. It just ended? That's I, okay. No, there is on. no okay. It's <laughs> done. Okay. We're good? Yeah. And Robert Stein says good morning, go to your classes. Good morning, Robert Stein. Thanks for, for saying hi. <laughs> I'm glad you love my classes. So, so it's, it's all very simple. You know how simple it is? It's as simple as flour and water. Matzah. It all boils down to matzah. It's just flour and water. It's so simple. The whole message is so simple. What we've been doing is extremely complicated. You also have to be careful of therapy because therapists, they'll, they'll, they'll hear all this stuff and then over here it's like, here after you pay them, you know, their $200 or whatever, this is where they sign, you know. It's just a stamp of it, like, oh yeah. <laughs> this is very, very deep and complex and, and painful and hurt. I understand you're hurt, and, you know, and I, I hope you that may, maybe we'll meet again before Passover when a lot of those people will be at the table who trigger you. <laughs> you understand, like, we're, we're literally paying for the validation of our sheep, of our Mitzrayim. Goof v'neshama. It's God and creation. Simple vibrational energy. Simple. By the way, there's obviously a need for therapy in certain situations. I mean, people have trauma that's been held in. It's got to get out. It's all kinds of stuff human beings store that need to be dealt with. But getting validated, getting like a signature from a professional that oh, you have all these issues. Not a lot of freedom there. All that, all you get there is just a validation that you know that your life's messed up. You know, your life's not messed up. You're amazing, and your and freedom is, is what you achieve when your vibrational energy goes clean. Just, just get free. Simple. Matzah. Flower. Yes, people are pretty complex, but matzah is super simple. Can I borrow your piece of paper? People are like, you know, they're so complex you can't even see them, but matzah is like super thin. You know, you, 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 even though it's right in front of their face, it, you see them. You can like see the whole person. Okay, that was the second day installment for the um, Pesach series. Uh, we'll be doing a few more days. Just remember, if you'd like to come on Wednesday, it's 2 o'clock. Okay? My class shifts to 2 o'clock on Wednesdays. Thursday is back to 3. Oh, yeah, you can't finish it.